and welcome to Bill on Bankruptcy. I'm Sarah Kopit, sitting in today for Lee Pacquia. And we are joined today, as we are each week, by Bloomberg News resident bankruptcy expert and editor-at-large, Bill Rochelle. Bill, our judge of the week this week is Judge Edith Jones. Can you tell me who she is and what she did? She is one of the judges on the U.S. Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in New Orleans. And until October, she was the chief judge of that court. And she is the target of a complaint for judicial misconduct filed this week. Now, very often, Sarah, uh, I just don't even blink twice at judicial misconduct complaints because more often than not, they're filed by crackpots. This one, however, is filed by four law professors and a number of civil rights organizations. Basically, they charge that Circuit Judge Jones made racially bigoted comments in a lecture. I got to tell you that this was not a charge that she said something off the cuff at a cocktail party. Rather, this was, according to this complaint, a lecture she gave at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, where presumably she thought about what she was going to say before she said it. So I can be as uh, close as possible to what the allegations are. Uh, pardon me if I uh, read a few of them, because they are quite interesting. Among other things, she said that racial groups like African Americans and Hispanics are predisposed to crime. She went on to say that those groups are prone to committing acts of violence, and they get involved in more heinous crimes than groups of other ethnicities. She also said that capital punishment was a positive service because, she said, uh, the defendants are likely to make peace with God in the moment before their imminent execution. She also said that capital defendants who raise mental retardation as a defense are abusing the system. And she went on to say that the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in a case called Atkins versus Virginia that prohibited execution of mentally retarded was ill-advised. Now, I must say that uh, there is, as far as I know, no recording or transcript of her speech. Uh, all there are, at least at this point, is affidavits by some of those who heard this uh, occur. Of course, we at Bloomberg contacted Judge Jones's chambers, but judges are not inclined to respond to things of this sort. The uh, complaint for judicial misconduct was filed with the Fifth Circuit in New Orleans. The complainants are asking that this complaint be sent to one of the country's other circuits because they don't think it's feasible in these circumstances for her brother and sister judges to rule on this particular complaint. There is some precedent for that because about five years ago, there was a complaint against Chief Judge Kosinski on the Ninth Circuit. Uh, that complaint ultimately went nowhere, but it was sent to a, uh, another circuit for disposition. How this ends up, I'm not sure, because of course, as you can guess, uh, a court on its own does not have the power to remove a judge from the bench. That can only be done through the congressional uh, process of impeachment. They can, however, uh, impose uh, sanctions of some sort, but I think we're getting way far ahead of ourselves because, uh, in all fairness, we have to hear what Judge Jones or, for that matter, others say because it may well be that what was actually said was not so radical as what was uh, reported in this complaint. Next to our case of the week, we have a three-way tie this week, Jefferson County, Alabama, ResCap, and Light Squared. How are three, all three of these bankruptcies similar? Well, I guess you could say they're all in the neighborhood of $2 billion. You know, heck these days, uh, uh, Sarah, bankruptcy cases really ain't worth our worrying about unless they're at least a billion dollars. Used to be we thought about $100 million as a cutoff, but it's a lot bigger than that now. Uh, Jefferson County, by the way, uh, looks like it has a deal. This puppy has been in municipal bankruptcy for about two years. They reached agreement 
with the holders of about 80% of their $3 billion in sewer bonds. That's the big nut that they have to deal with in this bankruptcy case. And what's going to happen there is that these bondholders are going to be refinanced out of the case for about 60% of the face amount of the debt. The big loser in this is, of course, J.P. Morgan Chase. They were the folks who did these bond deals and some swaps in the first place. And as we are calculating it, the total loss for J.P. Morgan is, get this, Sarah, about $1.6 billion. That's interesting because the very famous whale that we all know about that lost money for J.P. Morgan in London was a loss of about $6 billion. So this case by itself is maybe 25% of what the whale amounted to. Let's move on to the next interesting case, that is to say ResCap, formerly known or formally known as Residential Capital. Uh, they have, as we know, done a deal with their uh, parent, Ali Financial, that will finance a Chapter 11 plan because Ali's going to pay, pay about $2.1 billion. But here is the deal that's going down right now. Even though they ain't out of Chapter 11 yet and won't be for a good number of months, they want to pay off right now about $2 billion of secured debt. Not a bad day's work. They want to pay $1.1 billion on admittedly secured valid debt owing to the parent alley, plus about $800 million in junior secured bonds. Finally, we have Light Squared, a company that was uh, purchased and developed by Philip Falcone's Harbinger Capital Partners. They spent a ton of money on this company, I think $4 billion, developing a system for satellite uh, communication. Problem is, the FCC said, no, I'm sorry, we're not going to let you use the frequencies. After all, that sent the company into bankruptcy. But as we stand here right now, Mr. Falcone has told the world that he believes he's going to be able to raise more than $2 billion in new financing to pay off the existing debt in bankruptcy. So this will turn out to be, if this works out, a full payment Chapter 11 case. Now the question is, what do all three of these cases have in common? That is, there is one huge amount of money sloshing around in this world that just can't wait to go and invest itself in bankrupt or sick situations. Now methinks one of these days, uh, other parts of the economy are going to turn out to be more profitable. When that happens, and when you can get more than a fraction of 1% on government treasuries, it may well be there may not be so large an attraction as there is now in investing in these bankrupt companies. When that happens, these full payment multi-billion dollar deals may start disappearing. So Bill, in our advance sheets this week, you have an opinion from a judge in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Tell us why this is the most important decision of the week. Well. First off, uh, she disagrees with a federal circuit court in uh, uh, San Francisco. It has to do with the revised Rule 3001 of the Federal Rules of Bankruptcy Procedure. What is that rule about? Here is what it is. This was a great revolution. The rule maker decided that if you are a credit card lender, you shall, and the word shall is in the rule, along with your proof of claim against a bankrupt, give all kinds of detailed information regarding that credit card account. The question then arose, well, what if the credit card lender does not supply that information? The Ninth Circuit held back in 2009, in a case I reported at the time, that if you don't supply the information, your claim is thrown out, period, end of story. Bankruptcy Judge Rucker disagreed. She took a cue from a slightly different case in a different circuit and said, no, if you don't supply the information, it doesn't mean that your claim is dead on arrival. Uh, this is a really fascinating question, Sarah, because ordinarily when the word shall is used in a statute or rule, if you don't do it, something bad happens. But here it looks as though Judge Rucker is willing to give these lenders, credit card lenders, a free pass if they don't do it. So frankly, as we sit here right now, it seems to me there is no reason to obey the rule, at least if you are in her court. I'm mentioning all of this because if I've ever seen a case that really deserves to go to the U.S. Supreme Court, this is it. Keep your eye out. Bill, thank you. Very interesting information today. That's Bloomberg News Editor-at-Large Bill Rochelle. And as always, if you would like to know more about the topics we discussed today, you can find us at BloombergLaw.com or on the Bloomberg Terminal. I'm Sarah Kopit. Thanks for watching.